Hey everybody, welcome to the second channel. Uh, I'm still sort of figuring out this whole second channel thing. This is very uh, low production value setup. The lighting in here is terrible. I did get a new microphone though, so hopefully that's better than the first couple test videos. Today we're going to be answering a few of the most frequently asked questions and a few of my favorite comments from my most recent video about the water channel model for electricity. So to keep with the low budget theme here, we have Notepad. So first off, positive ion charge carriers. Positive charge carriers don't really exist. Unless, of course, you're talking about... In the video, I said that positive charge carriers don't exist. And I was referring to holes. So the idea of an electron hole... An electron hole is a quasi-particle, and it might look something like that. If you imagine that all of these red dots are ions, say silicon atoms, and all of these blue dots are electrons in very non-orbital-like drawings. Lewis dot structures are nice, but sometimes they pain me. The classical depiction of an electron hole is that Every atom here has eight electrons surrounding it, except in one spot you have a bond that's missing an electron. So this is commonly known as a hole, and the idea is that you could take this electron and you could put it over there, and then effectively the hole would have moved. I say that holes aren't real because they're quasi-particles. There is no actual positively charged thing that's moving here. You have a sea of negatively charged things that look like a positively charged thing is moving. Now, there are an awful lot of these things. Look, the same picture, but somebody did it better. There are a lot of instances where a collective of particles can behave like a single other particle that doesn't really exist. And that other particle that we can write down equations for but isn't real is called a quasi-particle. If you want to think of it in a different way, imagine a collective of electrons simulating another particle that isn't an electron. So that's what all of these are. Some of them have really bizarre names like the configuron or, let's see, uh, where's the, the weird polariton? First time I heard the word polariton, I thought somebody was making it up. All of these things, including electron holes, are things that you can write down equations for. Things that really look like they're in a material and for all intents and purposes are. Like we can write down wave functions for them and they behave as though they're real particles. But they're actually just sort of being simulated by a collection of some other fundamental particle. That might sound really weird and that's why I didn't talk about holes in the last video. But that wasn't actually the question. I said that holes weren't real, but I also said that there was no such thing as a positive charge carrier, and that's actually false. Every time that you have an electron, like an individual particle that is an electron, moving from one location to another, that particle has a certain amount of charge that is part of that particle. You cannot remove it. So when the electron moves, it carries its charge with it. That is the only way that electric current can exist. You have charged particles that move and sort of convect their charge along with them. However, electrons are not the only things that can do this. What I should have said is that there aren't positive charge carriers in solid state, like in metals, but even that is a little bit of a misnomer. So imagine that you've stripped one or more of the electrons off of a nucleus. So you have a positively charged ion and an electron. You can move the electron, and that makes an electric current, or you can move the ion, and that makes an electric current. It's just that in the vast, vast majority of cases, the ions are locked in place, and the electrons are what are zipping by really quickly. The most obvious form of ionic conduction, where you have positively charged ions that are moving around, is probably in, like, water. If you pour salt into water, you have positive and negative ions that are actually atomic nuclei that have charges that start moving around in the water and that constitutes an electric current. So it's very possible to have positively charged charge carriers for electric current. Even in solid state, it's possible to have positive charge carriers where if you're looking at like a solid state electrolyte in a battery or something like that, then positive charge carriers in solid state become really important. But these are never things that would come up when you're trying to learn about wires and resistors and basic electronics. So. I glossed that. Next thing I wanted to talk about was a great comment from 
Mosquito Life, which is a very interesting handle, discussing the scale of electricity. So I showed the water channel model in my video and it was a few inches deep and you could pour water in one side and it would pour out the other side because you generated sort of a slope in the water and it made sense. But in actuality, when you're dealing with electrons in a wire and you look at the quantity of electrons, then the, the height difference between the end that's full of electrons and the end that is depleted of electrons is like basically negligible. And there was an excellent analogy from mosquito life here. It's like having a reservoir the size of the ocean and adding a cup of water at one side and having a cup of water spill out at the other side thousands of kilometers away. The whole ocean actually shifts over a teeny tiny tiny little bit in order to make that happen. The cup of water that you dump in isn't the same cup of water that falls out. And it takes a long time for the whole ocean to sort of slosh over. But that's an excellent analogy for how electricity works and to try to fathom the scale of electricity. It just happens really, really fast and the forces are really, really strong. All right, so the most commonly asked questions about the water channel model were how to add capacitors, inductors, and transformers. These are very good questions and I have answers to two of them. So imagine this is our water channel model. If, we've, if we pour water into this end, the water's gonna slosh up and then it's eventually gonna settle where the whole water level is higher. A capacitor is a way of storing charge without dramatically increasing the voltage. A capacitor resists changes in voltage. So if we want this wire to be able to store more charge per voltage, let's just add a big reservoir on the side. So, I guess to make this a little clearer, let's look at it from the top. Something like that. And because this reservoir is connected to this trough, the water everywhere is going to be at the same height. So imagine now that we pour some water into this end of the trough. That really is clear as mud, isn't it? Maybe another way to think about it is something like this, although this one doesn't change the resistance. This would be like a wire with a, with a capacitor to ground sticking off of it. This with a capacitor to ground, but it also decreases the resistance, so you add a parallel conduction path. Water models are hard to match. But basically, when we start pouring water in this end, or when we start pouring water in this end, the water level over here doesn't rise right away, because all of that water pools up in here and it has to fill this entire reservoir, has to fill this entire reservoir up a certain height before the water level over here can start to go up. So if voltage is effectively the height of the water, capacitance is the amount of water that you have to add to make that level go up. So if you increase the area of the basin holding water, then you've increased the capacitance. You have to pour in a lot more water to make the water height go up the same amount. And if you attach a capacitor in the middle of a wire like this, then it's really not going to do anything in DC. It's not going to affect Ohm's law in any way, but it will affect dynamics. Like the moment you start pouring water in, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to take longer to reach equilibrium because you've got to fill up this big bathtub. Inductors are where a capacitor doesn't like the voltage to change, sort of resists changes in voltage by storing extra charge. An inductor resists changes in current. An inductor tries to stop electrons from accelerating. That means that if this pen was an inductor and you started to try to push current through it, it would be really hard to get those electrons moving, to initiate that current. And once those electrons were moving, they would want to keep going. It would also be really, really difficult to decelerate those electrons. The water channel model sort of has this by default. If you've got a bunch of water in here, that water is made of individual particles. And you have to accelerate, you have to apply a force to get each of these particles to start moving. And then once it's moving, you have to apply an additional force to stop that particle from moving. So say this water molecule is now chugging along, chugging along. You actually have to apply a force this way to get it to stop. When you're talking about electrons flowing through a wire, electrons have extremely low mass. They have very little inertia. So if you're looking at the actual force required to accelerate an electron like this, it's very little. But 
by shaping the wire in peculiar ways, you can force electrons to, well, that's a bad choice of words. You can make electrons look like they have a lot of inertia because every time that an electron starts moving, because every time that an electron starts moving, it, which way, this way, it makes a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is going to try to keep that electron moving. The universe really doesn't like magnetic fields to be changing. That is, when you start an electron moving, you have to apply a lot of extra energy to get that electron to start moving. And where does all that extra energy go? Well, it gets stored in this B field. It gets stored in the magnetic field that forms sort of a loop around the path of the electric current, around the path of the electron. That also means that when you stop the electron, you get that energy back. So if all of a sudden you say this electron has to stop now, say that you put a really big negative charge over here that is going to push this way against the electron and try to slow it down, the electron will slow down, but it's going to slow down and sort of going to harvest energy from this B field. This B field has to deplete before this electron can stop. And that means that the electron looks like it has a lot more momentum than it should for something as big as an electron drifting as fast as that electron happens to be drifting. In the water model, if we have individual molecules of water that are moving forward and then we have to decelerate them, it's sort of built in already. But if you want to make it much more significant, imagine adding a paddle wheel. So let's say you start pushing water into this side and the water level builds up over here and depletes over here. That's gonna really push this paddle wheel to start moving because the paddle wheel's stationary and the paddle wheel's really heavy. So it's hard to get the paddle wheel to start spinning. But the moment that you stop applying this force, you stop pumping water into this side, the circuit wants to go back to this equilibrium. But the paddle wheel's spinning and the paddle wheel itself is going to keep pumping electrons or keep pumping water around the loop which means that when you stop applying a force, it's actually going to push water up this side. The water's all gonna sort of slosh forward and the rolls will reverse. And then this will eventually apply enough of a force to stop the paddle wheel from spinning. And that makes the water look like it has a lot more inertia than it really does. So you can think of the inertia of the water like the real inertia of the electron. It's not really that much but the inertia that is granted to the electron by the B field, the B field that doesn't want the electron to accelerate, doesn't care if the electron's moving, it just doesn't want it to accelerate, that's like dropping a paddle wheel into the water stream. A paddle wheel that's not motorized and just tries to keep doing what it's doing. So probably related more to the inductor than the capacitor, I had people ask about transformers. In an electric circuit, you can have a component called a transformer that is basically two coils of wire that are very near each other. Sometimes you'll see it drawn like this, sometimes you'll see it drawn here, implying that there's like a piece of metal in between them that helps to conduct the magnetic field from one coil of wire to the other. But basically, if you apply an alternating current to this coil of wire with another coil of wire nearby, you're making an electromagnet that points one way. And then when the polarity of the current reverses, you're making an electromagnet that points the other way. And every time that, that magnet flips, during the flip, it induces a current in the second wire. And so when you're flipping from high to low, it induces a current this way, and from low to high, it induces a current this way, which actually means that it's gonna be like out of phase. So it's not that applying a voltage over here makes a current flow this way and applying a voltage over here makes a current flow this way. It's literally the transition between polarity at this side that causes current to come out the second side. That means that you really can't do it with a water model. <laughs> I did think about this. I was imagining some, you know, ridiculous system where you'd have like, I don't know, two, two water troughs and then you'd have to have some sort of like connected paddle wheel thing that attached them but this isn't actually it if you had solidly connected paddle wheels then every time that you float a current through this wire you'd get a current through this wire and that's not what happens you'd have to somehow make a mechanical linkage between these paddle wheels so that only while this one was accelerating was this one spinning and only while this one was accelerating was this one spinning and at that point you're not making a water model you're making a mechanical model of 
derivatives. So this is absolutely one of the limits of the water channel model for electricity. You cannot, to my knowledge, effectively model a transformer using the water channel model. I'm sorry. So next I want to answer a question from Frosty Llama, who also has a great screen name. And Frosty Llama is wondering about connecting multiple batteries in series and how that plays into this model. And I think that this model handles that excellently. So in the water model that I had in the video, I had a hose that was falling down and it was pumping water in. And then I had a hose that was coming out and it was pumping water out. And then in between, I would have some sort of decline in the water level that was akin to the decline in voltage as you pump current through a circuit. Now, the pump that I was using was pumping a constant amount of water per second. So effectively, this was a constant current power supply. A battery is not a constant current power supply. A battery is a constant voltage power supply for all intents and purposes. To simplify this, imagine that there's just a huge reservoir of water over here that goes on forever, and a huge reservoir of water over here that goes on forever, just because I don't want to try to draw a circular trough. So in the water channel model for electricity, I would say that a battery looks something like this, where you're pumping water from a lower level to a higher level, and you're always keeping the same offset. So this would be like, you know, if it was a nine volt battery, this would be like nine volts. And then if you had some, some resistors in the way that were blocking the flow of the water, um, maybe, then maybe this voltage would diminish. Uh, and then eventually peter back out. So uh, I guess I will try to draw it in a circle. Okay, fine. Circuits are actually always loops. So if you imagine pumping nine volts up, then the battery is basically moving the water level up that quantity and then it can fall through sequential resistors and fall back down to the original height at which point it gets pumped back through the resistors. So that's what a single battery would look like in the water channel model. But what do two batteries look like in the water channel model? batteries look something like this. So all a 9 volt battery does is pump electrons until the voltage on one side is 9 volts higher than the voltage on the other side. It doesn't care about the absolute voltage if there is such a thing. There sort of is such a thing, but it really never in circuits. You've got a certain volt, you've got a certain potential for electrons in this wire and then you send them through a battery and it pumps and pumps until one side is nine volts higher than the other. And then if you plug that into another battery, there's nothing saying that the two low voltage sides of the battery are the same. In fact, you've connected these two together, which means that they're at the same voltage. So the second battery pumps until one side is nine volts higher than the other side, which means that if you take the output of one battery and the input of the first battery, they're actually 18 volts apart. So this is how you'd put batteries in series. I guess schematically in a circuit. Uh, oh, now I have the do I draw it positive or do I draw it negative problem. Is this blue water that I'm drawing current? Yeah, I'm saying that nine volts goes up, so I'll draw it this way. So this is how you draw that in an actual circuit. Voltages are always relative, so you can pick a voltage to be zero wherever you want. Just for kicks, let's say that the voltage is zero in between these two batteries. That would mean that this is nine volts and this is negative nine volts because we can pick our level wherever we want. And then depending on the values of these resistors, this is going to be some mystery voltage. And that is a fun problem and it's called a resistive divider. If both of these resistors are the same value, then the value of the voltage in between is going to be zero volts because you got nine on one side, nine on the other side, and you just average it out. But if one of these is bigger, it's gonna, it's gonna pull it one way, which is the exact same thing that you can see in the water model if you make one of these impedances to water flow 
more significant or less significant the water level in the middle changes. Now a related question is batteries in parallel. What if instead of plugging one battery into the end of the other, you put two positive leads of one battery and two positive leads of the next battery? So in schematic form, the analogous circuit would look something like this, where you put two batteries in parallel and then you run it through some resistors, you know, generic electronic loads. So this is what two parallel batteries would look like in the water channel model. They both still raise the height of the water from one side to the other by nine volts. And this one, this one does the same. That's also nine volt, uh, V nine volts, but you can supply twice as much water at that voltage in this particular circuit it doesn't make any difference because we're using ideal batteries, but every battery in the real world has, a resistor associated with it. So you're limited. Even if you short out a battery, if you took a battery like this and you went bap, the voltage of that battery and the internal resistance of that battery would limit how much current was flowing. Like you can't have infinity current flowing th through a battery because the battery itself has resistance. That means that if you try to drive a load that has too low of a resistance, you actually won't get the full voltage out of the battery because there's like another resistor that's built in right here to each battery. So by putting batteries in parallel, you're effectively having the amount of that resistor, which means that in a real world situation, you can get more current out of that battery without the voltage from the battery dipping. This all happens because batteries aren't actually perfect voltage sources. So sometimes it makes a lot of sense to put a bunch of batteries in parallel. This is also the biggest difference between like all the sizes of batteries. So if you get like a double A battery or like a D battery, they're both one and a half volts, but the D battery has a much smaller internal resistor. So effectively it's like a whole bunch of double A batteries in parallel. This next comment is a fantastic question that really gets to uh, some surprisingly deep physics. Uh, some random string of letters and numbers says, why does the wire at rest not give off any heat? In the animation, right after you release the one volt potential and everything neutralizes across the wire, you still have electrons bouncing around evenly. But at this point in time, the wire won't become hot. So this is the animation that was referring to. At the beginning of the animation, we've got a whole bunch of electrons piled on one side and fewer piled on the other. And then when we release that potential, let me skip forward a little bit, all of the electrons equilibrate, but the electrons are still bouncing around like crazy. Why don't these electrons heat up the lattice in the same way that they do when you have electric current that's causing electrons to move? For that, I will let this clip play in the background and say that when there is no electron drift, the electrons and the lattice are the same temperature. The lattice is bouncing around. All of the ions that make up the lattice are continuously bouncing and, you know, wiggling. Effectively, you've got a whole bunch of ions that are connected by springs, like copper nuclei that are connected by strings. And they're just bouncing and they never stop bouncing because they have thermal energy. The electrons that are ricocheting between these ions also have thermal energy. The speed of the electrons, the electrons are shooting off in all different directions and bouncing off of ions they have an equilibrium energy. There's sort of an average energy to all of those electrons. And it's the same energy as the lattice that's already shaking. So to answer the question, why doesn't the lattice get hot? It's actually the lattice that's heating the electrons, if you want to think of it that way. But then once the electrons get too hot, the electrons heat the lattice and the electrons cool off. So just like you could have two blocks of material that are different temperatures, when you put them together, they're going to slowly equilibrate and become the same temperature. But in the case of electrons bouncing around inside of a solid material, it's just weird because it's like you've got two different materials. You've got all the electrons and you've got all the ions and you've got two bricks of material that are fused together that are continuously exchanging energy with each other, like with every collision. And even if the energy isn't 
equally distributed between those two things. Their temperatures are the same, so one can't heat the other. Now, in the case of electric current that does something like heat up a resistor, you're adding energy to that system. And you happen to be adding that energy to the electrons because they're the thing that can move. The electric field gives energy to the electrons, the electrons move, and then the electrons give that energy to the ions, to the lattice when they collide with things in the material. So while there's current flowing, you're adding energy to the system and the electrons sort of become hotter than the lattice in a way, which means that you have energy flow from the electrons to the lattice. But as soon as you stop that, the electrons are going to cool off and the lattice is going to warm up and you're going to be left with a lot of things that are shaking. They're just all shaking the same amount. At this point, I think I'm going to wrap it up because I've been drawing things now for uh, more than an hour and I need to start editing. So uh, let me know what you think of this format. I know that it's extremely informal compared to my normal videos, but there's almost always stuff that I want to talk about additionally in videos that I don't necessarily know how to make into the, the full package that can go on the main channel. Uh, so let me know what you think. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you did enjoy it, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. <laughs>